Hello everybody, it is Melissa here, the insurance exam queen, and I am excited here to go live today. So I posted I was going to go live today and I asked, what topic do you want? And I got insurance regulations. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure to like, subscribe, share, um, comment, let me know if the video have, uh, has helped at all. If you are unaware of how to study for your state or you're struggling to pass, please make sure you drop in the comments what state you're in so I can give you guidance on what it is that you need to know and study for your state, what is most important to focus on, and um, also make sure that you get any of my recorded classes that will help make sure that you can pass the exam. Um, links in the descriptions and things like that. You'll find it somewhere. <laughs> make sure you're in the Facebook group getting help um, and support from, from other people. So insurance regulations let's talk insurance regulations so the insurance this is this is this is usually a pretty decently sized chapter for for most people um some states can be as low as like five percent i think in arizona i i if i remember correctly and then it could be high as like 35 percent in wisconsin but for most people it ranges somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of the exam is gonna be on, um, I want my hand, so I gotta scoot back a little bit. <laughs> 15 to 20% of the exam is gonna be on insurance regulations. Now, what is insurance regulations? It's basically state law. In fact, your chapter may say um, insurance regulations or, com or North Carolina common to all lines. So whether it says common to all lines regulations or whether it says um, just insurance regulations or state law, this chapter is gonna completely switch gears from the other chapter. Hi, I see four people watching. Hello, hello, hello. Um, Al I, I recognize Alex's picture. Hello, Alex. Um, so there, uh, th this chapter will completely switch gears from any other chapter that you're studying. So whether you're doing property or casualty, life or health, doesn't matter. Th this chapter um, will be the same no matter what test you're taking actually. So. That's why it's a common to all lines. So a line of authority is life is one line of authority. Health is one line of authority. Property is a line of authority. Casualty is a line of authority. Personal lines is a line of authority. And that actually knowing that is actually part of this chapter because in order to be able to sell life or to sell health, you need that line of authority on your license. And you take the test to, to get that line of authority. So you actually have one insurance license and then they will put on there your lines of authorities. It's not like you. I have a health license and I have a life license. I have one license and my line of authority is life, health, property, casualty. So I, I do have all four. So whatever, and, and, and that chapter is all about that, licensing, insurance regulations, state law. So where every other chapter that you studied and learned was about policies, policy rules, policy provisions, um, this chapter, the state law chapter, the insurance regulations chapter is going to be all about the laws of being an insurance agent, the laws within the state, um, and, and all of that. Okay, so this, this chapter is different than, than all the other chapters, all the other topics that you talked about. Now. In the insurance regulation, state law, common to all lines chapter, whatever it is named in, in your state, it loves numbers, 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 numbers. So it's going to be loaded with numbers. It's going to be loaded with how um, and, and the, the things that I say right now are things to write down and pay attention to as you're going through this chapter, as you're going through the common to all lines, insurance regulation, state law chapter. Um, these are the most important numbers. So it's going to talk about the um, commissioner, the commissioner or the director or the superintendent. They all have different names. Um, insurance is a state run thing. It is not federal. It is not president. It is not Congress. It is, it is state run, more like governor and mayor type status. And in fact, the commissioner who runs the Department of Insurance is typically picked by the governor or elected alongside the governor, um, and they serve usually the same term in, in most states. Uh, now, the commissioner, the director, the superintendent, whatever name they give him, he is in charge of insurance in your state. So insurance is a state-run thing. The commissioner, the director, they are like the police and president of insurance in your state. 
So the head of the Department of Insurance, and most, most states call it the Department of Insurance. There's a couple states that have different names, like Florida, they call it the financial something, I don't know. But most states call it the Department of Insurance. He runs the Department of Insurance and determines all insurance law. Well, he doesn't set the laws, but he regulates the laws. He monitors insurance um, in, in everything that he is doing. Everything that he is doing is to protect the public, protect the public, okay? His job is not to protect insurance companies. His job is to protect the public from insurance companies, protect the public from bad insurance agents, okay? So that is, oh, I got a notification. I got an agency reaching out for help. Okay, so um, he his job, and that's, that's an answer. That's an answer. What is the job of the commissioner? Protect the public, okay? This is why he makes you take this exam because he's gonna protect the public and make sure that you are knowledgeable enough to be able to sell policies to someone, okay? So he is protecting the public from bad insurance companies, protecting the public from bad insurance agents, and making sure that you are knowledgeable enough to be able to sell policies to a customer. Because when you think about insurance, this is the financial industry. It kind of blew my mind that my title at the corporate company at ExamFX was financial services instructor. I'm like, I don't know nothing about financials. <laughs> but insurance is protecting assets, which makes it part of the financial sector. So if I own a car and it's worth $10,000, insurance is protecting that $10,000. You're protecting a financial asset that if it crashes or destroys, insurance will help to fix it and, re and replace it. So insurance is a financial industry, industry sector. We are protecting people's assets. We are protecting people's homes. We are protecting people's incomes. We are protecting people's families. We are creating estates. Insurance is, I'm, I'm going to go on a tangent here. My God, I love insurance. I love insurance. And in order to, to really be successful as an insurance agent, you want to love insurance. So if you don't love insurance, start talking to me about all the reasons why you, you want to love insurance. Insurance is amazing. You could be dirt poor dirt poor but as long as you pay your life insurance premium every month for 25 bucks whatever whatever it might be you die your kids make money you will leave your family with wealth if you can just pay your life insurance premium you can't save worth a damn fine pay me every month your little life insurance premium and i will make sure your kids have money when you die right like that's amazing what we can do with with insurance um you you have a parent you have a single mom. She's the only one earning an income in the family. Her children rely on her. She has to be the one that works. She becomes disabled. She can't work. If she has insurance, she's okay. She'll be set. She'll have a disability income policy paying out to her. You get a brand new home. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It burns down. Insurance rebuilds it. Like insurance is amazing. Insurance is incredible. It's what we all want. We all scream. We want Medical, we need health insurance. We want insurance. Insurance is amazing. In fact, I wish insurance ran the government half the time because they figured it out. Like they know how to protect everybody and to have enough money to do it all. Like what's really crazy with, with if you think, look at some companies like State Farm. State Farm does not make money from the premium. Like they don't take money out of the premium. The premium money that State Farm collects is just for claims. They take the premium money and put it in a bank account that grows interest. And that is how State Farm makes money. Not from their actual mutual customers, because State Farm is a mutual, which means that it's actually owned by the policy members. But State Farm doesn't take any money out of the premium. They hold the premium, reserve it for claims, let it build interest, and they only make money off of the interest. So like that is so cool. The, and, and then if there's money left over in the claim bucket at the end of the year, State Farm gives it back to all the policyholders. That's a beautiful thing. You're just like growing money off of money off of money and protecting people at the same time. So I love insurance. Insurance is amazing. You are saving people's lives. You are protecting people. You are helping them not lose their financials, their, not lose their home. You're making sure that they'll be okay if something disastrous were to happen to them or their family or their spouse were to die. My sister has three young children. Her husband is the main earner of the family. She does not work. She takes care of the kids. He earns all the income. If he dies or he becomes disabled, they're all stranded. But with life insurance, she's okay. And in fact, she'll be a millionaire. <laughs> because 
because of how much insurance. Um, I don't think it's that much. I don't think it's that much. Um, but, and, and that's another thing too. My, my sister and brother-in-law, if they both died, if something both happened to them, like they went to Ireland um, a, a few years ago and it was like, if both of them died, these kids are now mine. And they both had life insurance though. So like, it was like, it will be okay. Like we'll be okay. So knowing that you have that will be okay, that's what life, that's what insurance is. It is peace of mind. It is peace of mind that if something terrible and bad were, were to happen, insurance will be there to take care of it. Like that's a beautiful thing. Knowing that you have this, are you already solved the problem of your house burning down. You already solved the problem of crashing your car. You already solved the problem of having no income if your partner died. You already solved the problem of becoming disabled and not being able to earn income by buying disability insurance. Cause you can't really rely on the government. If you learn in the course, if we're talking about, you know, health insurance here, the, the social security disability is very hard to get. Most people really struggle. They deny 75% of the applications that come in. So you, you have to have your own disability insurance set up to, to be able to protect yourself. So anyway, um, when I'm on a tangent there, insurance is amazing, insurance is amazing. So talking about <clears throat> the Department of Insurance again, I don't ex remember exactly where I was at when I went on that long tangent, but insurance is protect, there we go, protect the public. So insurance is about protecting the public, protecting um, the, the job of the commissioner is to protect the public from bad insurance companies, protect the public from bad insurance agents. So anyway, now one of the things that he does to protect the public is he does examinations. And this is one of the numbers. We talked about some very important numbers to remember and then I went off on a tangent about insurance. This is one of the numbers that you wanna write down. Now, so if his job is to protect the public from bad insurance companies and bad insurance agents, how does he do that? He does that by going into the insurance companies and examining all their records, checking all their files, and seeing what policies they're issuing, what premiums are they charging, and are they collecting enough money, and are they investing their money well, are they saving enough money, do they have enough money to be able to pay their claims. Having money is solvency. Having money is solvency. So he's making sure that insurance companies are solvent. Insurance companies have to be solvent. They have to have money. Solvency, when you write the word solvency, turn it into a dollar sign. Solvency means we have money. So his job is to come into insurance companies, examine all of their records, look through all of the files, and see how well they're managing their money and making sure that they are solvent. If the insurance company doesn't have enough money, they are known as insolvent. Insolvent means that you don't have enough money. And if an insurance company is insolvent, he can come in and take over the company and he can either fix it or shut it down. So, so his job is to examine the records, making sure that insurance companies remain solvent so that they have enough money to pay their claims. And if they don't have enough money to pay their claims, they are labeled insolvent and he will either take them out or fix them or whatever. And some states get into detail about insolvents. In order to be deemed insolvent, you need to be not able to pay your debts and claims for three years or something like that. Some get into a definition about insolvent, but the main thing is knowing that insolvent means you don't have enough money to pay your claims. Now, when and how often is he examining these records? First, it's important to know he will examine them anytime he damn well pleases. So if he thinks that he needs to go into the insurance company, if he hears that, that they're doing something crazy and he's like, what are they doing? I need to go check that out. He can go into the department uh, or he can go into any insurance company at any time and he can um, examine their records and take a look at, at what they're doing. So anytime he needs to, anytime it's deemed necessary, he can go in and examine their records. Now, um, but he's got to do it also on a regular basis. Now for most states, that's every five years. Most states, he is going in every five years. There's like one or two states where I've seen three years. So I don't want to say five always and forever because there. that's the thing about this chapter is that's very state specific. So the numbers that you need to memorize are unique to you and your state. I can tell you which numbers to pay attention to, 
but I can't always tell you what the number is. You need to look in your online course, your pre-licensing state approved course, Excel, Kaplan, uh, AD Banker, ExamFX, whatever, um, Adjuster Pro, all of those, that, that's where you find the state specific data. I don't do that because I don't wanna be state approved because then I'm gonna be regulated by the state. I don't wanna be regulated by the state. I wanna be able to talk how I wanna talk and say what I wanna say. Anyway, they will have the data that you need, the, the exact number of what you need. I will tell you which number to pay attention to. So examinations are one of the important numbers. How often is he coming in and examining the records? How often is he coming to look at their files and, rem and make sure that they are solvent? Generally, it's every five years and also whenever it's necessary. Okay, but check your state. Okay, the next thing that he does is um, monitors licensing. So your name will actually be printed on a report the year that you pass your exam and it'll be, it'll be Alex Willard passed or signed up and got her license. He will see that, he monitors all the licenses. He has to receive a report of everyone who has gotten their license and which insurance company that they have been appointed with that is all documented and recorded into an annual report that, that he has. And that's another thing. Some states focus on, I would say about half the states um, want you to know that the commissioner has to have an annual report that he delivers to the governor, either financial or just whatever. Um, but th that's only if your state talks about it. So he monitors all the licensing that's going on in the, the um, industry, the insurance space. Now, when you go to get your license, there may or may not be state rules. So there may or may not be state rules. What I mean by that is some states, for instance, like New York, wants you to spend 90 hours in your property and casualty course. You must pass the practice exam and a certificate exam, and then you're allowed to take the state. Arizona is like, whatever, man, show up and take the state exam. Who cares if you study? They have zero requirement that somebody spend hours or take a practice test. So your state will either have a requirement or, or it will not. Um, and and you, you, can, you can find that by somewhere in your course, it, it will say that, or you can go to the, you can, um, you know, look, look it up the, the testing center if there's any uh, requirements. So some states will have requirements, some will not. If your state has requirements, they call it pre-licensing, before you get your license, I am a pre-licensing education teacher. That's that's my title. That's my job. I'm a pre-licensing um, educator, PLE. If your state has a PLE requirement, memorize the numbers. Like Illinois, you got to have 20 hours. I think it's like 10 or 20 hours per line of authority and 7.5 of them have to be in a physical classroom. Um the Ohio, you have to get a certificate exam. You have to, I don't know if they have hours or, or things that you have to, to memorize, um, but uh, double check what it is in your state. So if you have a pre-licensing requirement, pay attention to what it is and memorize those numbers. Then you want to remember once you get, uh, and then you need to know who can get a license, who can get a license. Be 18, pay the fee, pass the test. In order to get a license, I have to be 18, I have to pay the fee, I have to pass the test, and then I can get an insurance license. And also sometimes they throw in there, you have to be a good person. And what they mean by that is just no crazy like criminal record. Um, now, usually that question comes in the form of an accept question, meaning they will say, all of the following are needed to get an insurance license except. All of the following are needed to get an insurance license except, and the answer is the wrong answer. Remember, with accept questions, if it's an accept question, they are looking for the false answer, the wrong answer. So in that example, all of the following are needed to get an insurance license except, the answer is actually a college degree or a diploma. You don't need those. It's not a requirement, which is another reason why I am so passionate about insurance because you don't need to go to college. You don't even need a high school diploma. You just need to be 18 and pass the test and you can have a job. You don't need to prove that you know how to do book and stuff. I mean, other than like this test, <laughs> you don't need to have this like proving that you're doing all this, this work. So in order to get the license, I need to be 18, pay the fee, pass the test. 
I don't need a diploma and I don't need a college degree. I do need to be a good person as having like not a crazy criminal record. Now, if you do have things on your criminal record, there are some things that are okay and some that are not okay and it can be very state specific. Talk to your, your mentor, somebody who's hiring you into this or Google it, look it up. I don't, I don't know. Um, okay, so knowing um, how to get the license, be 18, pay the fee, pass the test, that's to get the license. Now, once you get your license, once you have your license, it's going to be good for a certain period of time. Most states, it's good for two years, but a lot of states are three years. So you, again, these are state specific numbers that you're going to need to double check your state approved course, Excel, all of that. You have to double check what they say, what the numbers are. For most states, it is 24 um, months though, or two years. And then, so you have your, how long is the license good for? And that's how long that if you take this test and you pass this test, it will give you a license that is good for two years. Then to keep that license going, and again, it's not always two years. You got to pay attention to your state. So let's say though it's two years. So they give you a license for two years. At the end of the two years, you need to do, and you can actually do it during the two years. You don't need to wait till the end, although most people do. I would encourage you not to do that though, because I saw a lot of emails working at the corporate company that was like, you guys didn't file my report and now I'm losing my license. I'm like, well, you didn't do your CE a month ago. You waited till the very last minute. <laughs> so don't wait till the last minute to do your CE um, just as experience from what I've seen. But anyway, your CE is continuing education. So going back to the job of the commissioner is to keep you safe and to protect the public from bad insurance companies and bad insurance agents. He wants to make sure that you are staying educated. He wants to make sure that, that Melissa is smart enough and educated enough and knowledgeable enough to continue to sell insurance. And that's what continuing education is, is making sure that you're knowledgeable. Now, it's not as difficult as studying for the state exam. You basically just read questions, do some quizzes, pass a test. It's not tricky in most, in most states. Um, and I recommend WebCE for your CE hours. Um, they tend to be a little bit easier, I think, for most people. And also... A lot of insurance agents need um, E and O insurance, which is errors and omissions. So if you're not working for a company, and even if you are working for a company, if you're working for like a salary position, they will get E and O for you. But if you're working for yourself in any way, if you're independent in any way, you're probably going to need to get your own E and O insurance. Which basically, if you are selling a policy and you mess up, you you misinform them, you accidentally make an error, you forget to add their car, and then you get sued for that, that's what the E and O will protect you from. You need E and O most of the time. If you get your E and O through a company called Napa, I believe that they will actually give you free CE. So that's something to, to, to look into. As an insurance agent, you're gonna have to do your CE every few years. If you get with a company who gives you the E and O and gives you the free CE, then that's awesome because you will you do have to pay for the CE. It's just the same as like paying for paying for your Excel course, whatever. You're gonna have to pay for your your CE. I don't know if Excel does CE. That's probably a good question. Okay. Um, anyway, um, so you have to do your continuing education. And how many hours do you need? There, some states will say you need 24 hours. Some will say you need 36 hours. Some will say you need 12 hours. Like you, the numbers can be very drastic. This is where the numbers get really hairy. When I say the examination is every five years in most states, I am solid on that. When we talk about continuing education, I'm like, it is, it is, you gotta look. I don't have them remembered. Everyone is like different, you, you've gotta look. But a good chunk of them are two years um, and 24 hours of continuing education. So I like to say if, if your license is good for two years, that's 24 months and you need 24 hours of continuing education, 24, 24. It's just a way to help you remember that. And um, so you spend your hours, you do your, your CE, and that will allow you to renew your license for the next two years. And then you'll do CE again at the, uh, you know, before those two years are up. So you wanna know how many, um, how long is my license good for? How many years is my license good for? And then you wanna know um, how many hours of continuing education that you have to do. Now, some states also have this thing called rollover. Well, let, let's say you only need 24, but you took this certificate program 
that gave you 30. So you have six extra hours that you don't need. You only needed 24. Some states will allow you to roll that over. Some will say, okay, if you did extra this year, you can roll them over to the next year. Every state, some say no, some say yes. And then if they do say yes, they might limit the number. They might say you're only allowed to roll over 12 or you're only allowed to roll over, you know, six of them or, or, or let's say in one, like you only need 24 and let's say you did a hundred hours of CE. They might say that you're only allowed to roll it over to the next period, not, not keep it forever and ever and ever, like use up those, use up a hundred hours over the next five, five renewal cycles. You're not allowed to do that most of the time. They will limit and say that you can only roll it over to the next period and they might limit how many um, you can roll over. Like I'm pretty sure in Cal Colorado, it's 12 that you can roll over, but you got to check again. You got to check your state approved Excel course, whatever course you have to, to double confirm those numbers. So those are numbers that are very important. How often they're doing exams every five years. How long is my license good for? How many hours of continuing education do I need? And um, if I'm allowed to roll any over and then ethics. So is part of your pre-licensing education and your continuing education, you have to learn ethics. And ethics are like ways of behaving appropriately that you're not hurting people, that you're being ethical. Ethical means that you're taking care of other people without putting yourself first, that you're doing the right thing, that, that's ethical. Um, and so you need to learn ethics when it comes to insurance. Now for most of your pre-licensing, it's built in. It's part of your course. California has a whole separate ethics course. And by the way, if you're in California, know that the separate ethics course is not on the exam. It's just an hour requirement. You just have to read it for, I believe, 12 or 20 hours, and that's it. You don't actually have to pass a test in it or when that stuff won't even be on the test. But anyway, so when you are renewing your license, um, so you get your license and it's good for two years, let's say, when it's time to renew it, they may say you need 24 hours and three of those hours have to be in ethics. And that's true for most states, that, that three of the 24 or three of however many you have have to be in ethics. And I like to say three for e-ethics, three for e-ethics. It reminds me that I need three hours for ethics. Now, it's, it's one thing to remember, if, if your state says 24, because that's the most common, again, you have to check your state numbers. If it says you need 24, those three hours are part of the 24. It's not 24 plus three, it's 24. And three of the 24 are in ethics. Three for E, ethics, okay? Um, another thing with that is some states will say that you have to do a certain because many people are licensed in all the lines life health property casualty like I am that's another thing to note when you are doing continuing education you're doing 24 hours or whatever the hours are regardless of your lines of authority you don't do CE for each line of authority you do your CE for your license so if you if you were listening back from the beginning I said how you you have one insurance license and then on it, it will list your lines of authority. I, I have a line of authority in life and health and property and casualty. I can sell all four if I wanted to. So I have all those lines of authority. You don't do CE per line of authority. You do CE per license. So whether you are only licensed in life or licensed in all four, life, health, property, casualty, you're, all, you're both doing 24 hours of continuing education. You don't have to do extra because you have multiple lines of authority. However, some states will say that when you do your CE, a certain number of them have to be directly about what you sell. So like if you're a property and casualty licensed agent, you have that line of authority and you're doing CE, you can't just read all life insurance CE. You can do some because they let you, you know, like when I was, um, selling car insurance. I remember doing CE on liquor liability. I just was curious about learning about that. How does it work when bars serve alcohol and they're responsible if people drive away drunk? I wanted to, to learn about that. So I did Dram Shop, li liquor, um, it's called Dram Shop is the, the name of the insurance, it's a liquor license and getting your liquor insurance. I was selling auto, I wasn't selling liquor, but I wanted to do it. 
So like you can take your CE on anything related to insurance, but some states will say that it has to be like if you're selling homeowners, you have to spend 12 hours in homeowners. That's some states. So just double check your um, text for that. So license numbers, um, pre if you have pre-licensing, you need to know those numbers. How, how long is your license good for? How many hours of continuing education? Three of those hours have to be for ethics. Are you allowed to roll over any? Um, and do you have any specific line of authority hours that you have to spend? And then in the life and health side of things, they usually want you to do certain out. If you're going to sell annuities, for instance, you have to take extra courses for annuities. Or if you're going to sell Medicare, you have to take extra um, Medicare hours. So your state will say that um, if it's if it's required. The other thing about that is knowing um, when they say that your license is good for every two years, they usually are going to base it off of your birthday, your birth month. I'm sorry, not birthday, birth month and not the date you got the license. So most, when you get your license, that's not the date that your license renews at. Your license will renew based on your birth month because it makes it easier for you and them to remember and keep it organized. So, um, and so they will usually say your license is due, if, if you have an odd number year, then every, every odd year you have to do CE. If you have an even number on your birthday, like mine is 87, I would be odd. So an odd number year, I would have to do I would have to do my CE every odd number, a, a one, a three, a five, a seven, a nine. And if you have an even number birthday, if, if it ends in like 88, then you would need to do your CE on every year that ends on a zero, a two, a four, a six, or an eight, an even number. So, and then it's usually due by your the, the last day of your birth month. For most, most states, they say your CE is due every... 24 months every two years on the odd or even number of your birthday um, at the end of your birth month. So you have the whole birth month to um, get it done. It's not based on your birth day, nor is it based on your license um, day. And I'm pretty sure that's true across the board uh, for most states that it, they, they do it based on your, your birth month. All right, what else do we need to know from this chapter? Now, those are the main numbers for sure, for sure. Um, and then also a couple for... Uh, La, 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 la. Fair Credit Reporting Act. There's a couple of numbers I, I need you to remember for that. But those are the main numbers for the Department of Insurance. The, the examinations, the license requirements, um, how many hours of continuing education, how many um, months is my license good for, three hours for ethics, do I have any hours to roll over, are there any specific hours I have to do for my line of authority. Those are the, the biggest, most important numbers. Then you're gonna read a lot of stuff about hearings, about penalties, about fines. These numbers will be harder to know and memorize because they could be all over the place. What I recommend is that you, when you're reading a section, so let's say you're reading a section about hearings and it'll be like 30 days, blah, 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 15 days, blah, 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 30 days, blah, 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 30 days, blah, blah, blah. Like, in the whole paragraph, oh my gosh, I got the Doberman eating the Chihuahua. All right, I'm just watching, <laughs> watching that right now. You're going to have this whole paragraph of um, text written out here. Let me show you real quick just so you can see what I'm seeing. Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> anyway, I might need to go save them. Um, Riker, no. Okay, it went away. Um, you're going to read this whole paragraph of things that are written out in a bunch of different numbers circle or look for the number that you see the most and just remember that number so like if, if you see 30 day 30 day 30 day and by the way always pick 30 day if you don't know it's the most common answer is 30 days if you don't know you're more likely to be correct if you choose 30 than than not and that's for like everything um okay so you uh so i'm being distracted by the puppy and a text just, just came in 30 days. Yes. So find the number that is most, um, that you see the, the most often, the one that you see the most, remember that number and say, okay, when I read the hearings chapter, when I read the section that was all about hearings, I saw the number 30 the most. So when I take my exam and they ask me about a hearing, I'm just going to choose 30 and hope that it works. And most of the time you'll be correct. When you get to a section about fees and fines, what number do you see the most? 
commit that number to memory. Um, and every state will kind of be different with their with their fees and their fines. Now the other big numbers to remember, and this sometimes is not in the insurance regulation chapter, it's in the general insurance chapter. It's usually though on every exam, regardless of what chapter it comes in, is rules about the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, so this is uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Insurance companies are allowed to pull our credit. They are allowed to look at our credit report, look at our credit score, and use that to determine our premium rates because people with bad credit are more likely to file claims than people with good credit. So if you have bad credit, if you have a low credit score, they will um, put up a higher premium. If you have good credit, you will have a lower premium because you're less likely to file a claim. So what that means though, is that they are pulling our credit. They are looking at our credit report. Now all credit reports are called consumer reports. So everything is a consumer report. There is a specific special type of consumer report called investigative consumer report. So you have, you have consumer reports, which represents all types of reports. And then you have a unique special type, which is called investigative. Now what's unique and special about investigative is that it requires an interview. You have to actually interview your friends and family or the insurance company, sorry, will interview your friends and family to confirm that you are a person that is trustworthy or whatever. Now this is not typically done in most cases. An investigative consumer report is generally only done when someone is asking for millions of dollars of life insurance. If you're a millionaire, asking for millions makes sense. But if you're not a millionaire and you're asking for millions, they want to they wanna double check. Are she just trying to get insurance so she can kill herself? Like, what's happening? So they want to do an investigative consumer report when you're asking for a lot of insurance. So it's not very common, but it is part of the exam, so you need to know about it. So you have all consumer reports, which pull from generally public sources, your job history, your credit report, things like that. And then inside the consumer report, you have the special little investigative consumer report. And what makes it special is that you are interviewing your friends and family. They're interviewing your friends and family. What kind of habits, habit, hobbies, habits? <laughs> what kind of habits does she have? <laughs> what is her lifestyle? Is she trustworthy? Is she someone of good character? What is her reputation? These are all the things that they're looking at in an investigative consumer report and they're interviewing your friends and family. Now, the numbers that are really important is when they're gonna do an investigative consumer report, if they are going to interview your friends and family, they have to tell you they're gonna do it three days in advance. So if they are going to do an investigative consumer report on you before they give you insurance to confirm that they wanna give you insurance, they have to tell you three days before they do the investigative consumer report. And then after they complete the report, if you call and you say, I want to know what's in the report, they have five days to show you what's in the report. They don't have to give you an actual copy of it, but they have to tell you, show you what's in the report. So my memory trick for that is I think investigative consumer report, three to tell, five to show. I have three days to tell them I'm going to do it. I have five days to show them the report once it's done. So three to tell, five to show for in, uh, investigative consumer report. The next number that's important, and by the way, with also with um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, when insurance companies pull our credit and they look at our credit and they judge us based on that, if there's something on our credit report that they, let's say that they pull my credit and they see that I have a loan that I never paid off, I took out a loan, I never made a loan payment, it's in default, it's in collections, and then they use that against me to determine my premium and I see that my premium skyrocketed and I'm like what the heck I give my renewal paperwork I'm like what the heck this doubled so I call the insurance company I say why did my premium double and they say well we did the renewal we we pulled your credit and it looks like you have this loan that you never paid off and so it made the premium go up I'm like I never took out a loan what the heck are you talking about they will then tell me what company they used. Now there's different companies for insurance companies like Lexington and things like that. But for the sake of our peace of mind of what we already know and understand, I'm gonna say things like Equifax and TransUnion because most people are familiar with them, the credit reporting companies. So let's say they say, well, TransUnion told us that you had this bad loan. 
So you then have a right to challenge the report. You have a right to go to TransUnion and say, TransUnion, why did you tell my insurance company I have this bad loan? I don't have a bad loan. As a consumer, as a customer, as part of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you have the right to challenge the report. So you say, that's not my loan. So they'll investigate it, they look into it. Let's say they come back and they say, Melissa, you're so sorry, we're right. Someone with your same name um, got a loan, somehow it got onto your report, we will take it off. Then the reporting agency, TransUnion, will have to send a new report to my insurance company. And in fact, they have to send that report to everybody in the last two years who asked for my information to update the correct information. Um, and then let them know that, hey, sorry, uh, TransUnion tells the insurance company, hey, sorry, we accidentally put this bad loan on Melissa's um, account and she doesn't have it. Then the insurance company has to go and fix my premium. They have to recalculate my premium with the correct credit score and refund me any money that they may have overcharged me for having the bad faulty information on the report. So a key thing there is that the consumer has a right to challenge the report. They have a right to know what is in the report and the insurance, the, the reporting agency, the, the company that the insurance company got the fair, the reporting from like TransUnion or Equifax, whatever, they, they have to investigate. They are required to look into it if you challenge the report. Now, the number that is important there is violating the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And by the way, I forgot this in the definition. You want to know the definition of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is that it protects consumers against the circulation of inaccurate or incomplete personal or financial information. So I'm going to say that again a couple of times because it is a question that is on your exam. And in fact, I tell people to tattoo this to their forehead so they don't forget. The Fair Credit Reporting Act protects consumers against the circulation of inaccurate or incomplete personal or financial information. The purpose of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is to protect consumers against the circulation of inaccurate or incomplete personal or financial information. Okay, that is the purpose. It's to protect, protect people from the circulation of outdated uh, in or inaccurate information. Oh, those are some more numbers. Um, <laughs> when they talk about that, that is to what what is um, inaccurate or ob obsolete. That was the word. I didn't. I was like, I say I'm saying the definition wrong, but I couldn't figure it out where it was. The purpose of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is to protect consumers against the circulation of inaccurate or obsolete personal financial information. What is obsolete or outdated? It's any negative information that is seven years old, like you defaulted on a loan, you forgot to make payments, whatever. That is uh, seven years negative information. And then 10 years for a bankruptcy. So if you had a bankruptcy, they'll put that on your credit. And if it's 10 years old, an insurance company is not allowed to use it to determine your premium rates. So they are not allowed to use any information, any negative information that is seven years old and they are not allowed to use any bankruptcies that are 10 years old to judge you for your premium rates with your credit score. The one last final number for the Fair Credit Reporting Act is a $2,500 willful violation. So if as an insurance agent, you're working for an insurance company who pulls people's credit, you have access to be able to look at people's credit potentially, depending on how your insurance company does this. And if you go in there and you look at it and use that information like, Let's say your friend is like, hey, I'm going on a blind date with this guy. I know he has insurance with you. Can you look him up or whatever? And you go into the, oh, oh he has a great credit score. You should get with him. That is a violation of the fair credit. You cannot just go looking at someone's information for, for a non-business need, you know? Or you're not allowed to judge someone on their seven years of negative information. If you willfully violated that report, if you willfully violated the rules of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, it's a $2,500 fine and that is another important number and that's a federal number so it's not state specific so it's a $2,500 um, purposely violating the Fair Credit Reporting Act okay one last number that I want to go over for insurance regulation and state law is do not call list now this is not in every state about half of you will have this 
but insurance is basically in the telemarketing field. So whether, I mean, you may not call yourself a telemarketer, but a lot of insurance companies are telemarketers. They just call and they market on the phone. So they have to follow telemarketing rules. And the telemarketing rules, basically, we, we have a law in the um, U.S. called the do not call list. And if a telemarketer calls you and you say, do not call me, put me on the do not call list, they must delete your number out of their system. They must mark it as not allowed to call you. And that's a, a rule within the United States. And it only works in the United States. Um, there are some tricky questions. I think I saw this on the Arizona exam. Um, you're calling a customer in Britain. What hours do you have to call them? They don't, they don't care. The do not call doesn't apply over there. So what the do not call says, one, the do not call says if a customer says to put, put them on the do not call list, you put them on the do not call list. The other thing is the do not call list sets hours for when you're allowed to call people, like how early you can call people and how late you can call people. And it's eight to nine. So you're not allowed to call people earlier than 8 a.m. their time. And you're not allowed to call people later than 9, 9 p.m. their time. So eight to nine. And when I took my my insurance, uh, my, my Arizona, they asked me how early, eight. They asked me how late, nine. And then they asked me in between, eight to nine. <laughs> they asked me three times about the do not do not call. So that is, that is something to uh, pay attention to. Um, if your state has a do not call, not every state has a do not call. Okay, so that's a that's a rundown on the insurance regulations um, chapter, the commissioner. You guys may have been commenting, but for some reason, Facebook doesn't allow me to see comments. I'm going to try and comment so I can see my own comment. But yeah, for some reason, I'm not able to see live comments when you guys um, are watching. So if you have made any comments or questions, um, I will capture them um, once I get off. And then again, if you have any questions or comments, please drop them below so that we can give you the help and the support that you need. And if you're struggling to pass your exam, make sure you sign up for some study buddy sessions with Angela. She is amazing. She is a little fierce. Um, she is a little strong, but she helps people make sure that they, they pass their exam. And we've had many celebrations of people passing after many attempts. Um, she is able to help them secure a pass in addition to the recorded videos. And that's a key thing is that she wants to stress with people is you got to watch my videos first and not just my YouTube videos. Um, but when you book a session with her, my video will be my, at least in the group study buddy sessions, my video link to watch my class will be available in that. So instead of buying my all access and buying um, study buddy sessions, you could just buy the study buddy session to get the recorded class in there, but you're only going to get the one specific to that topic. So if you were to book Thursday, for instance, which is general insurance and PNC basics, insurance terms related concepts, you're only going to get the recorded class for that concept for that um, study buddy session. But anyway, love you all. Sending you all the loves and vibes to pass your exam. Um, and I'm really loving coming live every day. So drop the next topic that you want me to come live on tomorrow, later tonight, whatever. Uh, whenever I feel like it, I'm loving this. So love you all. Have a fantastic day. Finish. Finish. Oh my gosh, it's not letting me hit the button. Uh, hit the button.